Hello there and welcome to Innovators in Care. I'm your host Reuben Bush and this is the show where we sit down with thought leaders in health and social care to talk about the problems they're solving and how they're innovating to reduce system-wide pressure and improve patient outcomes. In episode 6 we sat down with Emma Collins and talked about her work creating the Scottish Manual Handling Passport Scheme and the power of working together to improve care and planning. Now today we're talking to Simon Love and Sarah Thornton, Chair and Vice Chair of the National Back Exchange respectively. We'll be diving into the concept of optimised handling that Sarah and Simon have been devising and finding out what it is, how it works and the benefits that it brings. Enjoy. Hello, Simon and Sarah. Welcome to Innovators in Care. Thank, Thank you. you. Um, I think a good place to start would be if both of you introduced yourselves. Simon, could you start us off? I can. My name's Simon Love. Uh, I've been chair of the National Bank Exchange for the past six years. Uh, I qualified as a physio in way, way in the past um, and started to specialise in manual handling in 1991. So that's over 30 years I've been specialising in manual handling. So um, started doing manual handling in nursing homes and residential homes and then that's when I first came across the National Back Exchange because I wanted to find out whether what I was teaching was valid, relevant and up to date and that's where I first came across the National Back Exchange. Yes, okay. And Sarah? Well, I work for Care Police Council up in the north of England. I'm the moving and handling team manager. Um, I worked for the council since 1995 in various roles and then I found and got a passion for moving and handling. So I moved into the moving and handling team uh, well, 16 years ago I think now. And um, I'm an ergonomist. I've been to Loughborough University. I've got my master's degree in ergonomics and human factors. And um, I've a member of Yorkshire Back Exchange, and then uh, Simon suggested I um, join the board of National Back Exchange. So I did that six years ago, I think. So yeah, so it's been really interesting, a real learning curve. Very good. I think that brings us nicely on to what is the National Back Exchange. Simon, could you give us like a, a quick description of? what it is and what it does? Okay, yeah. a, a quick description. Uh, we're a charity. Uh, we've got over a thousand members uh, and one of our main aims is to promote and guide people into best manual handling practice. That's across every sector, health and social care and every other sector which involves with manual handling. To do that we disseminate information, we share information, we have a conference every year, we produce publications, We've got a very active membership uh, and we've got local groups where people on a regional basis can get together uh, with like-minded people and actually get hands-on practical. And that's where I learned nearly all my manual handling techniques was sharing information with other people at a local hands-on level. And I think the benefit of uh, National Back Exchange is that many practitioners work in isolation. You know, I'm fortunate. I work within a team, but what it does is it creates that moving and handling community. Uh, so we're all like-minded people and actually we're the only one of the kind in the UK. So Yes, and with something like moving and handling, it's very much around trying things and sharing ideas, isn't it? It's a really it good way to learn. It is. Uh, the day I stop learning is the day I'll stop being a manual handling person learn something every time every meeting there's something new there's a tidbit which I pick up and then that carries through not only to my practice but what I teach other people to do in their practice so it is an ongoing process mm. yeah. yes and I must say it's quite a sight seeing a scrum of manual handling trainers around some equipment <laughs> batting <laughs> ideas off it each is, other yeah. trying things and pulling it yeah. apart it's quite something to observe it's amazing if you show us 
any one piece of equipment, we can tell you what should have been done and how it could be improved. Yeah. <laughs> it's, it's just amazing. <laughs> We're very, very good at that. And yep. I remember once at the Yorkshire Back Exchange, somebody had a problem with getting somebody out of a bath. And within a drop of a hat, there were four people in a bath with towels and all sorts of things just trying. How could this possibly be achieved? So it is very much hands-on. We do try different things out. And it's great fun. Very good. So I understand, Sarah and so on, you've been working on a project called Optimised Handling. Could you tell us what that is? Yeah, we can. Uh, as a one-word statement, the Optimised Handling approach will integrate the needs of the person being assisted, the needs of the person giving the assistance, and the organisation or system where that is being delivered. It is uh, a moving and handling systems approach and it is to promote the power of the moving and handling field and the benefit of good moving and handling practice. Yes, okay. Um, and, and how did this come about? Well, it was sort of born out of necessity because the system as stood and is still standing, unfortunately, simply isn't working. So people are not being discharged from hospital very effectively. People aren't meeting their potential very effectively and handling isn't being done very effectively. So it was born out of that necessity. Um, and when you get one and a half million hours of commissioned home care not being delivered in a three month period simply because there isn't the care packages available, you realise that the system needs some amendment. Mm. And, and those that have been uh, involved in developing the approach and indeed our members, you know, we've listened to our members' um, experiences and challenges and their stories and then you know we've got our own experiences and stories and um, certain things were evident and you know from um, an external environment point of view you know we've in the social and economic climate at the moment we've got um, a, a, an aging population, a growing ageing population. We've got more people living with long-term conditions. So on the one hand, we've got uh, the demand for care that is greater and, and getting greater. And then on the other hand, we've got all these challenges like recruitment and re retention problems, budget constraints. So the demand and capacity is, you know, there's far more demand than we have capacity. And um, on, from kind of like an organisational point of view, what we've been hearing is that moving and handling specialists have been uh, retiring or leaving the posts and not being replaced or being replaced by a lower band. So to us that indicates that um, people, you know, the decision makers are not recognising the benefits of moving and handling. And then more at the sharp end, um, in some areas, moving and handling is only seen as safety, as a vehicle to reducing musculoskeletal disorders, which it does. But actually, we're moving and handling people, and the focus needs to be on the person as well, and safety um, shouldn't sacrifice that person's independence and rehabilitation potentials and enablement and independence and then of course from an equipment point of view you know you guys have designed and delivered all this wonderful equipment and I think in some areas that that is not being used to its best advantage and and we say in some areas because um, you know like with any field we have specialists that um, are working, some have different beliefs and in, working in different ways. Um, so essentially you could argue that we're all doing different things with different things and the idea of this approach is to um, make moving and handling more consistent across the UK. Yes, okay. And to go into a bit more 
in terms of specifics. How does it differ from something like single-handed care? Well, single-handed care is a concept which has grown force over the past 10 years now and in itself is really important. However, if it's not taken in the bigger system-wide approach, then it just becomes an isolated tool which people may be using and it's not integrated into the full system. In fact, it's part of the optimised handling approach, but only a small part of it. It is. Um, you know, the optimised handling approach says that uh, single-handed care is just moving and handling. Nothing different. We don't want to be seen to be seen as something different. It is just moving and handling. And, and what the approach says is that we use a single handler as a risk assessment baseline. So that avoids prejudicing the risk assessment before it's started. All moving and handling solutions are on the table from the get-go, so that gives the opportunity um, for that person to have a more person-centred um, care package or care plan being designed for them. Um, it avoids blanket policies and unfounded beliefs about how many handlers are needed for certain activities or certain uh, devices. So, and it is the product of a robust risk assessment. So we say single-handed care, we don't use that language, it's optimised moving and handling, we want to optimise people's care. Um, and we just use that single handler as a risk assessment baseline. Yes, okay. Um, and could you give us like a theoretical example of perhaps a moving and handling situation where you'd apply this and how it might work? In Kirklees, where I work, uh, we've been using this type of approach for a long time. Um, we've only just recently called it optimised handling because that is the approach coming out from National Back Exchange. Um, but we have many service users um, that are coming through the health and social care system and um, the, the problem is in some areas that the systems are very fragmented so everybody's using different pieces of equipment, everybody's using different practices. And then when we look at that person's journey, um, you know, what does it look like? You know, they, they interact or pass through multiple services, all doing different things with different things. And, and, and the outcome is generally um, an oversized package of care because they've not been having the right assessment at the right time. So what we do is we um, liaise with the whole system and we've tried to make uh, practice and equipment consistent and we have achieved that in our area. So that person's journey is a lot smoother, it's a lot more consistent and, and we assess at milestones. So they have a a, a right assessment at the right time. So when they reach the end of their journey, whether they, you know, particularly if they have an ongoing package of care, it actually is optimised and it meets their needs completely. It's not under-prescribed, it's not over-prescribed and they've got the right equipment to promote that independence and that enablement. It's okay, very interesting. Okay, um, so what is the focus of optimised handling um, in terms of the outcomes? Well, we have uh, three key outcomes. We call them the C outcomes. So it's safety, effectiveness and efficiencies. So that's what we are trying to achieve with uh, moving and handling activities, all those three outcomes. Yes, okay. Um, and, and what benefits does optimised handling give, um, I suppose, first of all, to the service user, most importantly, um, and then the carers, and then the system like, overall as a whole? Okay, well, the service user or the person being moved is the only consistent part of the whole process, because mm. they are the constant throughout everything. 
And the importance for them is they receive the same information and the same handling and they use the same equipment throughout their journey and it's not different. So there's greater compliance, there's better, they get used to the equipment, they get used to what they need to be doing. So there's that consistency which runs all the way through for the person which is really important. Another thing which is really important is that person achieves their highest potential, not just from a transition from one place to another place, but thinking about the end game. What is their final baseline going to be? And how high can we make that? So that they're always reaching their potential, aiming towards what their maximum potential is going to be. And I think just to add to what Simon says as well, <coughs> certainly for the uh, safety aspect, um, it is about reducing musculoskeletal disorders for the hand. It's about making, um, reducing accidents and making the activity safer. And it's also about, from an organisational point of view, uh, reducing litigation and sickness absence and all the associated costs around that as well. Yes, OK. Um, and so what does that then give to the sort of the system overall? It'll give you greater resilience. Uh, you're more likely to retain staff if you do that. There's more likely that the staff are going to feel more value placed upon them, having to give the extra training uh, and the investment which the organisation need to put into the staff. So their well-being uh, and their sense of well-being will increase with the optimised handling approach as well. Yeah, and it, and it elevates their knowledge and skills as well. You know, and what, what the optimised handling approach advocates is that there is uh, a specialist moving and handling practitioner. So they guide the practice uh, throughout their organisational system. So, like Simon says, it does achieve cons consistency. It does elevate levels of knowledge and skills. So actually, from an organisational point of view, that enhances their reputation. And, you know, and certainly if somebody is a profit making organisation, um, it will increase their customer base because of that good reputation. So, Sarah, where does rehabilitation fit into optimised handling approach? Well, that sits with the effectiveness outcome, because what we want is to uh, provide opportunities and the right environment to re rehabilitate the person. We want to provide opportunities for ongoing enablement and to increase that person's independence and well-being, um, you know, for, for all, whatever service they're in for, for the whole of the journey, you know. Um, so that is the idea behind the effective outcome. Yes. Okay, um, so how do people get access to this? So, well, the, the launch, we launched the Optimised Handling Approach last year and it, it's in a series of articles in our uh, MBE's journal column. So members have already had access to that. And this, the launch is a precursor to um, the introduction of our uh, standards of best practice. So those will be uh, a number of standards and some will be available to the general public because we, you know, it, we want all of the UK to, you know, to follow this approach and, and practice good moving and handling. Um, and then some will be available to members. So members, MBE members will have access to all the standards. Yes, OK. Um, and will you be um, adding in tools and resources going forward? Yes, I mean, the standards are also a tool. Uh, there are specific tools which we'll be bringing out as, as well, particularly related to early mobilisation, yep. which, which is a key from the acute sector to get everything moving there. So, yes, we'll make those freely available to members. Excellent. And a national back exchange of, you know, the idea is to kickstart this approach and um, and develop it as we go on 
with our members as well. So it's not just about us developing it, it's about, you know, that moving and handling community saying, this is what we need, you know, or this would be better if, and then we can develop something that is usable and workable to our members and beyond. Where single-handed care projects at the moment within the UK have been successful, it's taken usually one person who's incredibly motivated to move mountains and shift barriers to actually get it done because they've had the determination and the motivation to do it. What we want to provide is the tools for anybody to be able to do the same thing, have those tools already prepared for them. So their pathway to creating optimised handling will be much, much smoother than it was to start with. Yes, absolutely. And you mentioned earlier, didn't you, about it being a system approach rather than just single-handed care, which is perhaps a small part of it. It's part actually. of the efficiency outcome mm. is that, yeah. Yeah, so actually having it as a system approach with tools means that it could be adopted far more widely. OK, so um, what are you doing to spread the word about optimised handling um, and what are you doing to encourage it being adopted around the country? OK, well, we're doing interviews, Rubens. <laughs> that may yeah. help. Yes. Uh, <laughs> We've presented it <laughs> at conference last year. Yep. Uh, we're writing a series of three articles within column. That's our quarterly publication of NB already mentioned. Um, we're providing tools, we're providing information. Yeah, and we, you know, certainly from my point of view locally, I've done a lot of presentations on it. We've started using the language more i think that's key um and it, it's what we've done so far but what's upcoming we've got more webinars we've got um conference this conference in our next conference in september that is focused on the practical but it will be very much focused on those three outcomes safety effectiveness efficiencies um, and then, of course, we'll have the standards that, you know, some of the standards will be published this year. So then we will do another promotional, um, you know, push with those. What we're finding, Ruben, is where a successful system of optimised handling has been adopted and it's shown to be effective. Then it gets interest from other similar areas and it gets carried through and it gets carried through and it gets carried through and it feels like we're breaking through a whole series of walls which are there in front of us. We've broken through the first one which opens up into a second room which then has two doors and we're starting to break those down which get into larger areas. So it is starting to build up and it is starting to fan up and the importance is maintaining the momentum, giving people the tools and the things they need to be breaking down those doors because other people have done it. I think that's, that's the sort of key. Yes, okay, that's good. Okay, so moving forward, we've sort of obviously talked about what you're doing now and sort of in the short future. If we were to sort of take a step back and look ahead to say five or 10 years time, where do you see optimised handling being then? All over the UK. Common language. And, and actually it's not about the language, it's about the outcomes. It's about moving and handling being seen as, um, you know, safe. We want safe moving and handling, but we don't want that to be uh, at the detriment of the person. We want the focus to be on reablement, early and often mobilisation from the moment they enter the health and care system throughout the journey until the exit or they, they have long-term care, for that to be a focus. And of course, the efficiencies, because as we know, you know, uh, demand outweighs capacity. So we have to, you know, take care of our precious resources uh, and use them wisely. So, yeah, that's how I see this uh, in 10 years' time to be... Uh, to, for people to understand the value of moving and handling. I would hope that in 10 years' time, areas which didn't adopt the, uh, the optimised handling approach would be the rarity. 
and it would be the majority of people who are taking this on board and running with it. And I think that's a complete flip round to how it is at the moment. And, and in 10 years time, Simon, you will be able to receive an optimised <laughs> handling package of care. If and I'm, see if the I'm fruits I'm... of your labour. This is the, the only reason why I'm doing it. <laughs> Oh dear, very good. <laughs> oh dear. Right. I'm, I'm sure safeguarding what? my future. <laughs> <laughs> this is this pension scheme? <laughs> but I think you're very generous for ten years. <laughs> <laughs> oh she oh, I'll be happy with five. <laughs> Um, so you spoke about um, optimised handling being a system-wide approach. Um, what parts of the system, what stakeholders in particular, do you think need to be involved to make it work? Hmm. There's quite a few actually, Ruben. It's like a giant jigsaw and without the various pieces all slotting in, you're left with an incomplete picture. So it starts at the bottom with the care staff. It then goes up to the care agencies need to be on board. The care staff need to have the training and the confidence and the ability to be able to use the equipment which will, will enable in very many cases one person to be able to, to handle a person very successfully. So the commissioning agencies need to know what care agencies they are commissioning and under what pretext what they have to be able to do. You get the prescribers in the hospital need to have the confidence to be able to describe prescribe care packages into the community using the right equipment and optimising the care package. And it carries on right the way through. It does. And I think if, you know, I mean, I know the system, it, like you say, it's like a jigsaw and it's got layers. But if you think about the system as with a horizontal aspect and a vertical aspect, and the horizontal being the person's journey through all those um, services and care settings and then you've got the vertical which is more the organisational aspect so you've got the sharp end of care like you say you've got your handlers your teams the prescribers and then you've got the blunt end you've got the decision makers and and those are key because it, it's very difficult to change culture and practice from the bottom up we need that top down as well so and we need the decision makers to recognize the importance of uh, moving and handling and what benefits it provides to the whole system so and every single um, you know care setting or service as a vertical element and and that's the beauty of having and that's why we're advocating having a moving and handling specialist that oversees that and then that specialist can liaise with their system neighbours. So in essence what we want to do is consisticise the system. Um, so circling back to the MBE Simon, um, you've obviously been the chairman for coming up seven years um, and I believe your term ends in September. Um, could you tell us what sort of challenges you've had in that time and what change you've seen and what you've learned? Yeah, certainly. First of all, it's been an absolute privilege to lead an organisation and uh, over these seven years I seem to have surrounded myself with very powerful, wonderfully capable women. It's been good fun, uh, we've seen some major changes actually to the organisation itself and externally throughout the whole of the UK really. Uh, so internally we've changed our admin functions to an external company who deal with all the admin which has made a massive change to how efficient we are. We've seen a change of website which doesn't sound much however that's a long drawn out process for those yes. of you who ever had a website you recognise. I know, I know there is a well. lot of stuff there um, and I think one of the most exciting things about the website is now in fact the forum is being used as a very useful tool for the membership. So they're starting to use the forum 
Uh, there was a period uh, very recently of an eight day period where there were nine questions posted and nearly 60 responses. So that means it's being used, so it's going to draw people to the website. That's really, really exciting. I think most importantly over this period, we've gone through COVID, which is amazing now because it just seems like the dim and distant past. However, it was very, very real. And I think where MBE really, really came into its own was that support of the members through that period. Shall we do, do training? Shall we stop training? What shall we do? What's the recommendations? So that guidance in that period, I hope that the membership felt we were supporting them all the way through a very difficult time through that. So that was great. Um, and lastly, I think the, the whole ethos of MBE has become more professional of, over this period. Like I say, the management agency has made a big change. But generally the efficiency and what we're offering the members has tried to take in their thoughts, their feelings, what do they want out of MBE, and we're actually listening to what they wanted and I hope we're delivering it. For instance, conference this year is going to be very largely hands-on workshops, which is what people wanted. It's situated in the Midlands and it's got worldwide renowned speakers in as well. So we're doing whatever we can to fulfill the membership, what they want. Very good. And, and I just want to say that, um, you know, through your period of chair, Simon, that MB has gone through massive changes. You know, we've achieved charitable status. You know, like you say, we've got the website, we've changed our admin system. Um, we're a lot more professional and COVID. And, and Simon is very good at thanking the board and, you know, acknowledging um, people and making people feel valued for the for the contributions. So, and so I think, Simon, that I just want to say on behalf of the board, thank you, because your work has been valued. And I think the, uh, the work you've done uh, over these last few years will set MBE up for the next 10 years and more. Thank you, Sarah. <laughs> okay, so to round off something a little bit different, um, Sarah, what's the biggest positive impact you've made on a service user's life? Um, a gentleman that one of my advisors in my team assessed, uh, he'd been in hospital, lived with his wife, and he um, paid for his care himself. So the care package was going to have a huge financial burden on him. And she went out, she assessed him, um, found him suitable to be uh, cared for by a single handler. So, and that saved over nine hours a week, which is probably equate to about £180 a week. So that was a huge benefit to him and his wife. And then, um, she um, advised um, installation of a ceiling track hoist and what that is done is allowed his wife to provide the care so they don't actually have a formal care package and you know and both uh, Mr and Mrs have that flexibility of care routine and that independence and that quality of life um, so I think that is one of the most recent positive examples I could give you. Yes, that's really good. And Simon? Ooh. <clears throat> I had a client uh, who wasn't able to communicate. Uh, her mother, though, desperately wanted her to continue to be walked, mm. which required assistance of two people to be able to do that. And... Um, nobody was willing to assess that as being safe. And the mother felt this was a huge detriment to her daughter. So I went in and had a look at what they were doing and actually thought with positive risk taking, with the right training, there's no reason why it couldn't be done. And I explained all this to the mother and she actually broke down crying that somebody had actually listened to her, what her needs were, somebody was willing to take that risk or being competent enough to actually take the risk and decide that it was it was a risk worth taking. Um, and at the end of the day, uh, a few weeks afterwards, she was being transferred manually for nearly all her transfers. Okay, 
Very good. Okay. It's been very good to talk to you both. I think we've covered a lot of ground around the optimised handling and package and how that works. And I think it'll be very interesting to see how that develops and grows over the next few years. Thank you very much for coming along. Thank you. Pleasure. Thank you very much, Ruby. Very good. Well, <laughs> that was certainly fun. Whilst we had a good laugh, or laugh, there was a lot of important information in there about the optimised handling approach and the benefits it can bring. I think my main takeaway was the importance of considering the whole system, where a single-handed care focuses on a small part of it. Optimised handling actually brings about a whole system-wide approach um, and working together actually means you can deliver the best care for the patient and as a result efficiency for the system. So that's episode seven of Innovators in Care. Trust you enjoyed it and we'll see you next time for episode eight. Thank you and goodbye.